Hello, it's Eric Miskell with EMS Now, and welcome to this edition of EMS Now Up Close. Today, it's my pleasure to speak with John McGee. John is the Vice President of Sales with Freedom, and Freedom, of course, is one of the major independent distributors based out of Florida. John, welcome. Uh, I've had you as an, an interview before, but you were part of a panel, so this is my first opportunity to speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Uh, I look forward to this. Uh, why don't you, for the benefit of the audience, give a an introduction to yourself and maybe a few comments about freedom. Sure. Yeah. Good morning, Eric. First of all, and uh, yeah, so I'm a I'm a 30 year industry veteran, um, almost exclusively in distribution, and I've played on both sides of the fence in both franchise distribution and a, a large global, um, and on the independent uh, side. It's about 17 years on franchise and about 13 currently on the independent side. <clears throat> um, I joined Freedom uh, three years ago. Um, and Freedom was had charted a course after hiring our, our president, John McKay, about six years ago um, to kind of reposition ourselves, um, you know, if you will, re reinvent ourselves a little bit, even though our, our goal was to stay within the independent space. You know, uh, we, we wanted to address needs in the market, right, and um, kind of went at the business from that perspective. So well, the, the shorter version of it is, uh, John got the path started. Uh, he brought me on um, after growth was initiated um, with the intent of continuing to grow our, our customer facing uh, organization, uh, our relationships with customers, you know, based on my experience. And I've, I've done everything from uh, frontline sales, global account management, uh, supplier development, uh, large team building and, and management mentoring, all that good stuff. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Um, before we get into our discussion, let me just ask you kind of, you know, it's been an unprecedented few years, um, sure. as they like to say, um, but uh, how would you assess kind of the current state of, of, of the industry and the component and material supply chain, and then also your own business and how it's- Sure. Yeah, and I would say probably like most people in my position, Eric, I'm, I'm reading every tidbit that I can find, right? And, you know, a lot of it's opinion, of course, right? And, and obviously that some of what you're gonna hear now is my, my version of that. Um, it, it, I think it's really interesting because I think there's some competing factors and, you know, um, I, I'm, I don't mean to undermine any of the OCMs, you know, the, uh, the TIs, STs of the world, right? But when you, when you look at it, maybe a little cynically, um, those guys are really not overly incentivized right now to change things, right? Um, even though they're currently their stock prices are taking some hits, that has nothing to do with their their raw profitability, right? So their profits are, are up quite a bit during this time. Um, they have unprecedented insight into the demand of their customers because of the lead times, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's some belief that you know they want to bring lead time down, but you know from my side, if I'm a business person, well, if I could have a 52 week visibility into my demand and had the ability to maybe raise pricing a couple times, you know, within a calendar year, um, that's pretty good for my business, right? So, so I think that's a competing factor of what everybody else may want if you're on the consuming side, right? I want to get back to where, you know, lead times are within a quarter, right? Where I can manage that and live within that kind of spectrum and everybody can kind of work in that, you know, the hiccups are, are a lot less painful there. You know, because today, if you miss that cycle, you know, you could be 20, 30 weeks beyond what you hoped it was going to be if you misordered or, or something like that. So so I think that's one element of it. Um, you know, the other side of it is, you know, there's all this uh, news about uh, fab capacity and fabs being built. And, you know, obviously, Intel just acquired Tower, <clears throat> you know, which will close within the next 12 months. And you know, even though they're a relatively small percentage of the global market, it's still capacity that Intel's bringing on. You know, they want to be a fab, uh, fab company. So, but most of that stuff won't help us, you know, the general market for two, three, maybe even four years, right? <clears throat> they're complex to build, um, you know, whatever issues come along with the supply chain, they're, uh, they're not, you know, unaffected there. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, that's the other element. And, you know, I'm hearing, you know, you hear some opinions where maybe there'll be some loosening of things by Q4 this year, but right on the tail of that, Intel comes out and says, hey, I could see this, you know, staying the way it is until 2024, right? Which, you know, collective sigh from all the consumers out there, right, of EMS and, and, and the OEMs, um, you know, nobody wants to be dealing with this for another, you know, uh, 18 months, 
you know, because we've already been in it for 20, you know, 22 months, something like that. <clears throat> so in our, in, in my <clears throat> crystal ball of say two quarters out, it all looks very much the same uh, as what we've been dealing with, you know, for the last several quarters. Demand is high, <clears throat> lead time is still a challenge. Um, you know, pricing, if you want short delivery is still an issue. <clears throat> you know, there's elevated costs out there in the market. Um, I can't see very well beyond say September, October right now within our business, it's just unrealistic. Uh, but our new customer acquisition remains strong. Um, you know, customers who already engaged with us in the last 12 months, very active repeat, you know, activities there. Um, you know, so from a freedom perspective, um, it has helped us get to the table with many new customers. And um, we think because we've provided really good service that we're staying an active participant. And, and then our goal becomes, how do we maintain that position when the supply chain, you know, say, quote unquote, returns to normal? Um, and that'll be a big part of our strategy over the next you know, year to two years of, you know, how do we stay at the table? You know, maybe it's a lesser role, but, you know, we've done good work. So, you know, they, they want to uh, have you in the mix, you know, maybe for a variety of things, maybe not even the same things they use us for today. Okay. <clears throat> Very good. Now, you know, you've touched on what the issue I wanted to talk to you about, it, which is the time, right? We, this has been going on for two years, it's several years more, the grind that the industry is going through and what's happening. And you've referred yeah. to it as, uh, and I've seen some things about supply chain fatigue. So yeah. t tell me kind of what you mean. By yeah, you know, we, I, I think um, times like this have really reminded us how fragile most of the supply chains are out there and all the elements that are part of it. So it's not just, you know, the manufacturers, you know, the EMSs and the OEMs that make their own products. <clears throat> it's the logistic companies that are, that are tied to this, right? Um, it's distributors, whether it's the big franchise distributors or, you know, independents like ourselves. Um, and, and the suppliers, you know, within the, those realms as well. So I think um, all across it, <clears throat> you know, we, we all maybe are enjoying some increased demand and, you know, if you're on the distribution side, um, you know, uh, a better view of your, of your sales matrix going forward. Uh, but it's hard to sustain, right? How do you keep, it, it may sound counterintuitive, but how do you keep, just as an example, salespeople super engaged every day when, everything is a problem, right? How do they not, you know, sometimes at their desk be like, what do you know, how do I catch a break here, right? And even though in theory, right, you know, they're commission salespeople and that's good for them, it's still challenging. It's been two years of, of very aggressive all day, every day. It's an emergency for the person on the other end of the phone or the email. Um, you know, they're, they're panicked, they're going to miss revenue. You know, they feel their jobs are at risk. I mean, all these dynamic uh, personal things that uh, that lead to that fatigue. And then again, it goes back to the general supply chain. Um, you know, prior to the onset of COVID, um, if we were shipping out of the Asia, Asia region, um, we could like clockwork, get a box from Hong Kong to Tampa in two days, like clockwork, right? I could count on it 99.9% .9 of the time, whether it's UPS, FedEx, you know, DHL, it was like, boom. COVID hits, right? That starts changing, um, you know, and then now all the evolutions of COVID, right? You know, China with their policy, it's it's their policy, right? And I understand, right? They want to protect their, their people. But we now may see if we're trying to bring something, say, out of mainland China like Shenzhen, it may take five days just to get it to Hong Kong. Now they're understaffed, right? So I'm, I'm now looking at a box from Hong Kong to Tampa taking anywhere from five to nine days, right? And it's, it's unreliable and sometimes it shows up in three, sometimes it's 10, right? And, you know, nobody wants to deal with that uncertainty, especially when we, we seemed like we had kind of figured it out, you know, where customers got accustomed, like, okay, it's not a couple of days anymore, it's three to five, well, now it's seven to 10. And, you know, that just adds to everybody's angst, you know, in the process. Yeah. And that's interesting because the fatigue, as you indicate, is, is kind of the human, it's related to the human side, but less so the system side. Because systems, you keep them plugged in, they can go 24 seven, right? They, yeah, yeah, in theory, sure. sure. Yeah, in theory, exactly. But uh, um, so how would you, are we, 
to, to the point that you're talking about, you know, how would you assess kind of the, 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 the stamina, the commitment, the, the, the competence of the people who are doing this? Are we losing good people as a result? I don't know if we lose them, but I think uh, the worst thing that could happen to us, right, with any of our staffs is if they feel that there's nothing else they can do to impact the situation, right? That feeling of helplessness, right, can can be, you know, you start to go down the other side of the path, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, and, and this might not be exactly where you were leading with this question, but one of the things that I think that's that's come out of this fatigue is we, we've seen a development of different tasks in the market now. So where OEMs, um, you know, were had for years outsourced their PCB manufacturing DMSs, DMSs are inundated because of the shortages, right? And they have multiple customers. So the OEM stepped in at first to maybe buy a key component, right, to help facilitate their build. And they realized that they needed to do more and more of that activity. So <clears throat> they hoped that it was a short-term thing, say, or maybe for a couple months, we got to allocate some staff. We got to buy parts, even though we haven't bought parts in years, right? We buy assemblies. And now they've had to um, really go even beyond that, right? So because of the longevity of this, you know, they're 12 months in and they've had to allocate teams and they have to, they're, they're putting programs together with companies like us to say, how do I secure my supply chain, right? And we have multiple OEMs that have put in, you know, inventory bonded type programs, even with the prices being elevated, elevated because um, source of supply is more important to their business. They, the, the companies that have strong visibility um, have totally taken ownership of their supply chain. And again, they don't really want to do these activities, right? They're things that they hope to hand back to the EMSs at some point, but there's no end in sight, right? So when I have either check-in calls with these OEMs or just through our normal course of, of doing, you know, the, the activities that we're doing, you, you can hear it, you know, in the conversations, right? They People who thought they were on short-term assignment um, to help manage their CM supply chain are now in it, right? And they're dealing with it and they're making decisions every day about, yes, I'll, I'll approve that price. Oh, yeah, a thousand pieces will help me even though I need 10,000 pieces, you know, and, you know, will you let us schedule those things? Will, you know, do I have to take them right away? All those kind of things. So, you know, there, so, and then the, the EMS is, you know, I, this is just my perspective. It's good because they're, they're, you know, they're, they're able to spread the wealth around a little bit, but, you know, it has to be a little bit of a hit to their value prop too, you know, um, because all of a sudden I, I you know, my, my customers now doing part of my job that they intended to pay me to do. Right. So I think all those things lead to pressures and on all pieces of this. Um, and, and for us, again, our, our customers is whoever needs the support. Right. And, and freedom's goal has been, you know, even we're an independent, I, I think of us very much as a services company, you know, what is the, com what do our customers need uh, to facilitate their supply chain? And sometimes that's, you know, shortage, you know, uh, uh, scenarios. Sometimes it's, again, we're, we're doing uh, long-term inventory programs to help uh, companies mitigate, you know, what they perceive as really high risk from a uh, lead time standpoint. Um, I recently had an OEM Eric, tell me that they had, uh, TI had behested them a year ago to place orders a year in advance, right? And they were taking them direct. <clears throat> and I'm like, well, how's that going? You know, big OEM, you guys must be getting more support than other companies. And he says, yeah, they've decommitted on all um, all the orders that I placed a year ago that they asked me to do, we did. And now, you know, we're still back coming to you looking for shortages, right? So, you know, there was real frustration in his uh, tone, um, you know, because he, he thought he had solved the problem by placing orders 52 weeks ago. And now he's, you know, a year later, dealing with the issue still because, you know, um, you know, capacity and demand, it, it continues to outpace, you know, what's going on out there. Yeah. And that's an excellent point. I mean, about the relationships across that from, from the distributors, the OCMs, and also that the CM, the OEM, that kind of value chain and how that goes. Um, and, and the fatigue within that, because that must be strained, but yet I think to be successful in those relationships are so critical, right? You have to yeah. be to know where it is and, and from OEMs have to kind of take a broad approach to it. 
uh, rather than a, a singularly focused kind of a supply chain side, right? Yeah, and, and to add on quickly, Eric, one, one of the things that we're trying to do to, to alleviate that, uh, that fatigue or strain is, mm -hmm. You know, if the OEM is initiating the, the process, right, it doesn't mean they're not manufacturing it still. Their, their contract manufacturing partner is still intending on building that you know, deal. So in some cases, um, the OEM is placing an order to kind of get the ball rolling so that we, from an expediency standpoint, we don't lose inventory that's available in the market. Mm -hmm. And we're allowing their CM to then take over that order at the OEM's behest, right? Or the second scenario is, the OEM, um, they take ownership of it financially and we just ship it to their contract manufacturer for them, right? So they don't have to handle the material and deal with that portion of the fatigue. Because again, they're not really component managers at this point, right? They wanna manage sub-assemblies and, and systems and things like that. So, you know, those sound like simple services, but it's what the market needs and we're flexible enough to provide that activity. Yeah, and it sounds like you just made an excellent point there that. Uh, established strategies are changing constantly here, right? You have to adjust to the reality of what the current situation is. Yeah, and you know the the joy of being an independent, if you will, right? Is uh, my my philosophy has always been flexibility helps us rule the day, right? Um, I can do things that other companies uh, won't do or are unwilling to do, right? Um, to, to provide a service to my customers. And if that's valuable, right, I get an opportunity to play tomorrow and maybe next week and next month, right? And that's, mm -hmm. that's the goal is how, how do you, you know, how do you get customer loyalty? How do you get customer entanglement? And, you know, there was some easy fits at the early of, of the onset of COVID because shortages, right? I can't get parts from my normal place. I came to you, you were able to get them in a couple of days, right? That's easy value prop. Um, but again, for longevity here, now it's like, well, geez, what do I do? And can I see my demand out past, you know, next month? Right. And how do I secure myself? Because do I want to do this very activity again tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow? Or do I take a couple extra steps today and secure myself for maybe a quarter or two quarters? And we're, we're really playing active, actively in that kind of positioning. And, and again, we hope that that alleviates some of that fatigue because you, you've now transitioned that problem into, okay, I fixed that one. I can work on something else that has become a bigger issue. Maybe it's not even electronics, right? Maybe it's my, my metal plating business or my plastic molding business or something like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you indicated previously that, you know, <clears throat> you can see out to maybe September. Um, so how do you see this? What's your best guess at how this gets resolved or does it get resolved? Or is this just kind of the new normal for the industry now that we're experiencing? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say new normal, right? I, I think, um, I, I think there will be a, there eventually will be a softening from, a. it, it either maybe demand, you know, recedes a little bit or, or maybe again, capacity does just catch, catch up well enough. Um, what I think we've we've learned is that I'll go back to you said unpre unprecedented before. Um, there's more suppliers that are affected with lead times than ever in any allocation that I've ever lived through in my career. Right at one point it was just memory, and in 2018 it was pr predominantly capacitors. Right. Well, now you have. 50 suppliers that are quoting 40, 50, 60 week lead times, right? It, it's really dramatic. So I think some of them will fix their scenario, but I think there will always, oh, for the next several years, there'll always be some things that are disrupting the supply chain and, and probably because demand will remain strong, right? You know, even though I don't really, Freedom doesn't play in the EV field, right? Electric vehicles, but the, sh the sheer capacity that they're gonna take from the market is gonna create supply chain problems for the mid tier and down type customer that maybe is, is Freedom's true you know, target you know, market. And you know, mid tier and down, it's probably a couple hundred thousand companies globally, right? I mean, right. if you think about it, right? I mean, the biggest of the big are the big, but you know, there's a lot of companies that are solid size companies, but um, they're gonna be figuring out how do I compete with that you know, business that is pulling capacity, you know, out of the market. And, and that includes supply chain too, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, battery factories are being built everywhere. All of a sudden, you know, UPS and, and FedEx got to get there too. 
Yeah, no, exactly. And it's interesting what you say about EVs. We've been talking a lot about that as kind of the next product wave to grow the EMS industry or to propel it. Um, yeah. And uh, a lot more people will be doing that in the next five plus years will be pretty crazy in that particular area because it's a high growth thing that really EMS can are in a position to support very well. So Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and even, you know, even for that. So if you're a traditional PCB company, you know, OEM that, you know, uses PCBs and, and you're in, maybe you're at the bottom tier of the big EMSs, you know, send me the Jable Flex, you know, will you be bumped because they are, you know, pursuing that high volume uh, business coming from, you know, uh, you know, huge companies globally, right? So, you know, all those things are potential threats to their supply chain and they're going to have to figure that out. So maybe, you know, the, that next tier of EMS who, who over the last year or two, they've been acquiring and building a better footprint in the Americas and things like that, you know, uh, maybe companies at two or three locations now have seven, eight, nine, because they realize that maybe they can, they can win some business as that push down happens, you know, um, and, and I think that's good for those companies and it's good for companies like Freedom because they're more, again, our, our target, you know, uh, customer long term. I mean, that's really where we fit. Yeah, no, that's excellent. Um, listen, we come to the end of our time. I want to thank you for, for, for sharing your thoughts with me. This has been fascinating. I think our audience really will appreciate it. Um, and uh, I wish you continued success and hopefully later in the year, we can get another catch up and see beyond September, right? We can see then where your, your crystal yeah. ball is there, so. Yeah, and I, and I think, I think Eric, it'd be interesting because you know the traditional summer business in the Americas was always light for the electronics industry pre-COVID, right? So that changed that. And uh, I'm interested to see what the summer is gonna hold, right? Will we see a softening as maybe people get back to taking time off and you know, enjoying vacations and things like that, um, or because the demand's so high, will we just continue to run forward, right, uh, into the fall? Right, exactly right. So, excellent, John. Well, listen, thank you very much for your time, for your insights. We appreciate it. And like I said, hopefully we can catch up again in the future. All right. Thanks a lot, Eric. Great to talk to you. Thank you, sir.